don't you know you're not supposed to wear white after Labor Day? Good morning, noon, and night, everybody. It is I, Adam Pakora here, and you are tuned in to Requiem for a Tuesday. How the fuck are ya? That's right. Your boy working on Labor Day, grinding out here for all of y'all, but that's what it be, you know, this money 24-7, don't stop the grind, don't stop the hustle, hashtag never sleep, hashtag the mug is full, I'm sipping that bean juice, fired up, Monday morning, ready to go, we got a big episode For y'all, I got as many topics as I could possibly get together. This the Labor Day holiday special. It's not really, but you know, it's coming out tomorrow. So (laughs) that's just how that's going to have to be. Um, before I even do the plugs, I just want to say an additional top. Like things just keep getting added and added, and that's great. We're getting into that time where things are happening. The summer's dull. It's hard to do. You know, there's not a whole lot coming out, but we're hitting that stretch. Football season's here, starting on Thursday. Could not be more excited. We're going to do a whole NFL thing today. All the shows are coming out. You can't escape the stuff. So we'll get into all that. So this morning, well, now it is this morning as I say this. Whatever, you know what I'm talking about. God damn it. Uh, (laughs) saw a beautiful moment from the Venice Film Festival. They screened that new Brendan Fraser movie, The Whale. You know, we've all been saying for years, where has he gone? What has happened? There's various photos you may or may not have seen, which may or may not have been edited or may or may not have been based on many things that have been speculated. Regardless... What happened? We don't know. He's back. And got a standing O that wouldn't quit. Brought him to tears. Was a beautiful moment. He tried to collect himself and just couldn't. Because the ovation just overpowered him and kept going. And the praise just keeps going. And you got to love a positive moment. That's all I got to say. I'm excited. The movie seems fun. It's about a fat man. It's probably going to be really sad. But... (laughs) But it seems like something I'm very interested in seeing. So, you know, maybe next year I'll be flown out to the Venice Film Festival as I fucking deserve. And I can report more accurately on these things. But my point overall is, God bless you, Brendan Fraser. That time, uh, what's it called? It's not time travel. It's effectively a time travel movie. But that movie where he's in the bomb shelter, incredible premise, horrific execution. I'm not okay with that movie, Brendan. That's all that's all I want to share. But hey, glad you're moving forward. Um can't wait for the flick. All right. Let's plug it up. So you already know the drill, ladies and gentlemen, but you know what? Actually, you don't, because you don't listen to me. No matter how many times I fucking tell you what you got to do, you don't do it. You don't do it. Okay? Rate, review, subscribe to Requiem for a Tuesday. Okay? <laughs> Coffee's kicking in, fellas. Uh, rate, review, and subscribe. Apple, Spotify, Google, you name it. We're on it. Rate, review, and subscribe on any and all of them. Do me a solid. Hook your boy up. Those Spotify reviews are still not even on display, which means we don't have enough, which means you're not doing it. So come on, folks. Rate it up. That's right. I'm on my knees. I'm groveling. I'm begging. Show me the dick. Okay. (laughs) Check out the merch. Rfat.bitcartel.com. We got totes, pins, uh, stickers, pens, and some coasters for Justice's show. Check out his show, Microwave Minutes. Check out his music, Chef Juice. Check out mine, Wolf X. Check out our music together, Multiplex. All of those are available streaming on all major streaming platforms. 
as well as Bandcamp if you're an indie fucking nerd and that's what you use exclusively. That's fine. Hey, do your thing. We're there for that reason. Uh, <laughs> you can follow me on Instagram at adam.rfat, R-F-A-T, duh, Requiem for a Tuesday, get it, ha-ha. <sighs> That's right, I'm slurping right in your fucking face. You fucking like that, you little piggy bitch? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're having fun today uh what else we got i think that's it you know they're all the same everything's linked in the description below if you're interested in fucking anything that i've ever fucking done in my fucking life you fucking look in the description click a fucking link okay thanks man i haven't done a morning show in a while these are lively aren't they okay so let's just dive right in we got a slew of topics to get into today the first of which I've been meaning to talk. Remember last week where I was like, I feel like I was supposed to talk about something. And I couldn't remember. And I was like, nah, it's probably fine. One of those times, to- I meant two things, actually. So one I'd forgotten about for like three weeks. And the other I was supposed to talk about last week. So we'll get into the older one first. I want to talk about a little movie I like to call Light Year. I like to call it that because that's what it's called. All right. So, famously, as stated by Chris Evans, just to be clear, this isn't Buzz Lightyear the toy. This is the origin story of the human Buzz Lightyear that the toy is based on. (laughs) Which, I will say, when all that that meme went around making fun of that tweet and like trying to explain what this movie is, I didn't get the confusion i it made perfect sense what they were saying it's about the care like the character buzz lightyear like it's not about a fucking toy really not that complicated especially because i remember i don't know when it came out let's say it was like 1999 was the release there was a fully like hand-drawn cartoon animated aka not computer animated Buzz Lightyear movie which he had like a partner who was a chick and a robot or something uh and it was just like an animated thing of them the same thing them being like the real character what he's doing he's a space ranger they're on a space mission they're trying to fight zerg or whatever the fuck And it was great. I loved it. And then that spawned into a TV series which watered everything down and it wasn't very good. And that's fine. But that movie was great. And at no point was I like, wait, is he a toy? Like, I was like, you know, I was a small child. And I was like, oh, so this is what... Within Toy Story, the action figure came from. You know what I mean? It's just not that... I, I understand trying to word it out how it's not that easy to word but i mean come on if you can't follow along with that concept it's really not that hard so anyway i thought there was a great chance that this movie would be terrible reviews were mixed but mostly positive i would say overall But I also kind of feel like Pixar has been on a downward trajectory. I mean, really, ever since Cars, but they've had some big heavy hitters since then. But I do think they've lost their automatic magic, which is fine. I mean, it was pretty unreasonable to be on such a run of greatness and to just hit a home run every fucking time you step to the plate. You're going to hit a single eventually. You're going to strike out eventually. It was only a matter of time. Steve Jobs died. John Lasseter's a perv or whatever. Maybe not. I don't know. I think for real he was. It wasn't like an overthink. Regardless, a lot of things have happened. A lot of things have changed. This movie's really, really good. Uh, to a very surprising degree, I have some notes, but let's dive in. Okay, first of all, this movie's directed by a man named Angus McLean, <laughs> which 
unbelievable. Congrats to you, sir. Um, your life must have been pretty disappointing based on your name. You thought you were going to be like a fucking cowboy <laughs> CIA operative or something. <laughs> like, that's insane. But anyway, so the movie starts right away with Buzz and his friend waking up from their like deep whatever that's called deep sleep thing Jesus I'm so off my space game I guess hibernation right whatever that's called where you're sleeping in space uh okay anyway so you know they're on a mission and they get to this strange new planet and all of a sudden they're attacked overwhelmingly so and Buzz is piloting and trying to get the fuck out of there, basically. But they're being so overwhelmed that he's not really able to do so. And he tries to make this really risky maneuver, whatever. It doesn't work. They crash and they're stranded on this planet. So this... I mean, this small crew is stranded on some unknown planet and they have to like, they're like, how the fuck can we get out of here? So basically what they have to do is set up shop and be like, all right, let's start building. We need houses. We need whatever. We need to protect ourselves. We need all this stuff. So pretty much there's like a time lapse thing. They establish like a colony basically on this planet. And Buzz is like, we got to get the fuck out of here. Like, especially because this is my fault, you know, like the guilt is weighing in on him. And so we need to test. They need to get into like hyper speed or light speed, you know, which makes sense in order to get out of there. So Buzz does this test where he like slingshots around the sun. It's the old Star Trek time travel thing. And he's gone for a couple minutes, gets back, it's four years later. He hasn't aged, obviously, all this stuff. Um, and everything is changing. So Buzz gets back. His friend now has a girlfriend, which this is what everybody was upset about with the gay kiss. It's two black ladies sharing a peck real quick. I thought that, like, Buzz was pumping dude's cheeks this whole movie. Like, it's this is... Such a non-issue, it's unbelievable. Anyway, so Buzz gets back and he's like shook. He's like, what the fuck is going on? You know, that would be rough to adjust. It's like coming out of a fucking coma. You're like, oh, here's an iPhone. And they're like, what? Uh, <laughs> and uh, he gets this AI cat. Which I thought small criticism here if this thing is set in the future and there's like full-on space travel and he technically just time traveled you would think that the robot cat would be a little more realistic looking it do i mean i get it it's a movie they're trying to show that it's a robot but at that point in time wouldn't robots be so sophisticated that you could just make it look like a real cat you know whatever picking nets there uh, the cat ends up being a fun little sidekick. He can do all this stuff. He's a little computer, whatever. They're friends. Um. Anyway, Buzz just keeps going, and he's like, "I gotta get, I gotta get us out of here." Um. But every time he, again, every time he comes back, four years goes by. So he just keeps missing time and time. And then every time he comes back, the colony is more developed. There's way more people there. I mean, people are fucking having kids. Like, they have to live their lives still. And he just keeps going, keeps going. And his family keeps, or his friends keep getting older. He doesn't recognize as many people. They don't really know him. And then, of basically, eventually, he's able to accomplish it. And he gets back and everything's completely... Well, let me backtrack. He's like, I'm going to do it one last time. Like, I got it. I know what I need to do. And the people who are in 
quote unquote charge, which is weird. He should be in charge, you would think, seeing as how they're the ones who started the whole fucking thing. They're like, no, you're done. We're not doing this anymore. Blah, blah, blah. And he's like, fuck it. And he steals the ship. Goes on one more last one. Succeeds. Comes back. It's 22 years later. Everybody he knew was dead now. It's been so long. And he's essentially like wanted. And he gets there and there's this like mysterious ship hovering up above. And they're like, everybody's at risk now from some like invasion type thing. And he's kind of got to piece everything together, like what's going on. So basically he links up with his old friend's like granddaughter at this point, or maybe just her daughter. I can't remember. And her bumbling friends. Now, these characters are the worst part of the movie, not because like, oh, they're just bumbling idiots. Like, sure, that's what you kind of need for the movie to work. Um. They just don't add a lot of value. There's not a lot of comedy that comes out of them. There's not enough interesting story that comes out of them. They're pretty just underdeveloped outside of the daughter, granddaughter. I'll just call her daughter or whatever. Outside of that, they have like no story. They have no purpose. Uh, None of them really do anything positive or negative enough that it matters and they're it's just a weird group that i don't think it's kind of like an up where up goes the direction it doesn't need to go you know where it's like oh here's you know i don't know i don't want to get into up but i I just thought up was going to be something completely different than what it was this isn't necessarily that bad of a switch but Not a fan of the supporting cast in this one. Anyway, this is where we're introduced to Zerg, who is like a giant mecha robot in this, which I don't know if that was ever really touched upon. I know that uh, it was like Zerg is Buzz's father, but that was really just so they could throw the Star Wars reference in there. I'm guessing they're not taking it seriously. Anyway, spoiler, big reveal. Zerg is Buzz. The timeline's like split or something or merged when he completed the loop. They explain it. It doesn't, I mean, you know, this science shit, whatever right (laughs) like it either could make a ton of sense or you could just say that and either way whatever it doesn't matter they both exist and this version of buzz is oh that's what it was so this one succeeded much later in life i think he just kept going and going and going i can't remember exactly but regardless there's two buzzes one of them is now evil buzz doesn't realize it at first then once he does they go on the offensive against zerg blah 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 you understand and so forth Basically, the Zerg buzz is also trying to steal this time crystal thing. Time crystal. Jesus. So Buzz's whole thing was I have to figure out how to get this light speed going. As I've said, sorry, it's all coming back to me now, so I got to kind of talk it out. Uh (laughs) And once he finally succeeds, he's like, okay, this is the exact formula for the fuel that we need to get out of here. Now, Zerg is also looking for that formula because he never succeeded. So that's what it was. And now that Buzz has it, he goes to Zerg, who he's like, oh, you're just other Buzz. Like, we're on the same page. Regardless, that Buzz went rogue and he was, you know, the things AIs do where they're like, people are inefficient. He was like, I don't give a fuck about none of this. Like, kill all of them. I don't care. Whatever. They want to stay. I don't want to stay. And he's like, but they're your friends. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> and so they end up doing it out over the fuel cell. The whole thing ends up where Buzz wins, but then burns the fuel. And then they're stuck with there as their home. But it all works. You know what I mean? It obviously all works out in the end. So, I have a few notes, and then we'll pretty much be good to move on. But I think that there are some 
There's one major tweak to the beginning of this movie that I think would make it 10 points better, a whole nother level. I'd move it up a letter grade. So the movie opens with just like a little thing of text on screen, and it's like, in 1995, a boy named Andy went to the movies and fell in love with a space ranger, blah, 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 whatever it says. And it's like, this is that movie. So it's like, okay, cool. There's all the context you need, Chris Evans. That was a much easier way to put it. This is the exact movie that spawned the character love of Buzz Lightyear that became a toy phenomenon. I could see it. One of my questions is about this before I get into my note. Uh, Did, like, is this movie supposed to be live action in this world? Right? Because Andy and everybody's animated already. So it's like, those are real people. I did air quotes there. So... In Lightyear, are these supposed to be real people, or is this an animated movie? I'm assuming it's a real movie. It's just an animated world, if that makes sense. See, now I'm making it more complicated than it needs to be. Okay. (laughs) My suggestion would be something along these lines, okay? You open with an establishing shot of Andy's house. Now, I probably wouldn't recognize it, but maybe I would. Not the point. Andy is playing with Woody in his room. And you hear a call from Andy's mom. Like, Andy, let's time to go. Like, we're going to the movies, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, the dog runs. And maybe they do a quick pan around. And you can see all the all the existing toys still in the room. You know, if you want. You could spend as much time doing this as you want. But either way, I figure this will be like a two-minute opening scene. Nothing crazy. But you knock all that out. Andy runs downstairs, brings Woody with him, okay, gets in the back, whatever, they drive to the movies, Uh, but on the way, he's just like, oh, I'm so excited, like, oh, you ready to see Lightyear, like, yeah, I can't wait to see Lightyear, it's gonna be so cool, blah, 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 you know, so all that gets established, okay, they pull into the theater, Andy's so excited, you know, him and his sister, whatever, and the mom and dad, they get out of the car as quickly as they can. And, you know, he's going to leave Woody on the seat or whatever, but he leaves in such an exciting rush that he knocks him on the ground or something. He's like face down. And then they do that pan in of the dead face, you know, because obviously they do the. Oh, we're at, like they go into toy mode and they're just frozen, but you just do the zoom in of Woody's frozen face maybe he makes a little animated face after they get out of the car that's sad whatever i think it would be good either way then they walk into the theater they sit down and the movie starts and the screen expands and becomes full screen and that's it they don't cut away back to the theater the movie doesn't end and then they cut back and they leave the theater just give me that little intro Instead of, that's what the text accomplishes, I understand. You know, I mean, you can't, it would be more efficient if you could, like, title prologue. Right? Like, that's the thing. Or here's here's another idea. The way Pixar usually does, like, shorts before a movie, make that the short before the movie to provide the context because I get it. It does ruin the illusion of like this is an independent movie. Now it's like a Toy Story movie, which it is anyway. I just think it adds a lot of value cuz then it is technically like a Toy Story prequel kind. You know what I mean? It's just more connected. Uh the text thing is just lazy. Is really my thing. I think if you're going to reference Toy Story at all, it would have been better in a little scene like that. Uh, But overall, the cinematography is great, which just means the animation is great. Like, and the concept alone, it's a great 
sci-fi story. Like they basically made a children's high quality, high budget science fiction like epic. I loved it, frankly. But all the space stuff is great. The action sequences are great. Like this is a great sci-fi movie. I think overall. Uh, like I said, the supporting cast isn't the best, but you know they're not the main part. Um, it does feel. My only other criticism is that it feels like it's an origin story only, which it is. Don't get me wrong. But, like, it feels like them being on the planet is the, like, being stranded on the planet is just part of the intro, and then it should expand. If that makes sense, almost like the whole movie Like, the premise of them being caught on the planet feels like it would have been, like, the first 30 minutes, and then it turns into the whole thing. But I do think that there's enough there for it to explain everything. And I think that for an intro movie, it's kind of like the first Iron Man, where it's, like, an hour that he's not even Iron Man yet, you know? He's just captive and all this. You have to build the actual story, uh, establish the characters, all that shit. And, like, it's a real dilemma. It's a real crisis. So they're really trying to show something. And I think with doing all the gaps in years, like, that is what validated it. Because then it turned into its own story. It felt like, oh, this is going to linger and they're just going to... You know what I mean? This is never going to get resolved and they're just not going to do a full story. But, no, there is a full story there. It all comes full circle the Zerg buzz thing is interesting. Like, it all works. It definitely all works. I guess ultimately what I'm saying is, is that this movie has plenty of material for there to be, a, if not multiple, a sequel. You know, like, there's so much that they could explore and go into. I, I don't know. I think that because it bombed, it's probably just going to be a one-off, which is sad. Uh, cause this is a movie was a lot of fun. So if you got Disney plus go check out Lightyear. let me know what you think. All right, we got to move cause I am going slow somehow, even though I'm fucking on fire. <laughs> um, okay. We'll just touch on this briefly. I just wanted to talk real quick about the rehearsal Nathan Fielder show on HBO Nathan Fielder, a pure genius. Uh, Nathan for You is an unbelievable blend of reality, comedy, surrealism. Like, I don't know how much of this is scripted. I don't know who's an actor. I don't know what's what. It all feels very real and authentic. Um, Nathan Fielder is technically like an amazing, unbelievable actor for being able to stay in character the whole time. Like, I can only recall two or three times that he broke character on that entire show. Uh, namely the realtor who said she got raped by a ghost or whatever. Unbelievable stuff. It, it's crazy to me that that show exists and went on for so long. And when it ended, it was tragic. He almost immediately announced the deal with HBO, but then it took a while for it to get going. He produced How To with John Wilson, which I've talked about on this show. Phenomenal show in the same vein it's from the same strand of DNA as Nathan for you, but the guy has his own spin on it. Anyway, the show that show's excellent. And then after a lot of time, boom, the rehearsal is here. And you can see why it took so long. Just fucking conceptualizing this thing must have taken two fucking years to really nail down what they were trying to do, let alone execute all the production, the building, everything that has to go into this, the hiring, the coordination, the editing. Like I can only imagine how extraneous of a process this was and overall what I have to say is that like nobody is even willing to try this hard let alone execute at this high of a level the premise of this show is very complicated I guess I think as you watch it it makes perfect sense but I keep reading and hearing people say that this thing is very confusing I don't really see that I just think it's a dense high concept thing But, like, just pay attention and watch, and I think it's pretty clear. But basically, the concept is you are trying to face a tough moment or decision in your life. You need to come to terms with something, whatever it is. 
you are worried about how the outcome will outcome. <laughs> uh, Nathan Fielder can help you with this. So he is going to take every detail of your life and the situation, learn a bunch about you, and then hire a ton of actors and build sets to replicate places in your life. And so you can recreate this moment and practice it over and over again. So there is a so the variable outcomes can all be addressed and you know exactly what you need to say to this person in the real moment. Now, the first one is like a guy trying to uh, conv- not convince. He's trying to confess to his trivia partner that he didn't get a master's degree. And he is like super shook about it. And they recreate the bar as a set, like the bar that he does trivia at as a set. And they learn a bunch about him and the woman that he is trying to reveal this to. And they try to recreate it. And it's unbelievable. And it just keeps spiraling into more and more like, oh, now we're going to do a rehearsal version of the rehearsal. So we have a fake version of the guy we're trying to help so we can help him the most accurately. And basically, it's just a long spin of that. Then it turns into this. Then the next episode, I believe, begins this elaborate childbearing project where they build this woman's dream home. It might have started in episode three. I don't know. Um, and they set up a solution where she can go through the entire 18 years of motherhood in like six weeks or something by swapping out kids and having them age progressively or whatever. Uh, and that divulges into like a million other things and it's just amazing. And then there's a couple other one-off ones like that trivia one, uh, that last like half an episode maybe. But the main focus of the entire series is this child one. Nathan ends up getting involved himself. There's Uh, (laughs) anti-Semitism. There's just so many things. And he is brilliant throughout the whole thing. He handles everything great. At one point he opens an acting school. But then has to do a rehearsal version of that. So he can be an attendant. So he knows what it's really like. So there's another version of him that's. It's just unbelievable. It's incredibly elaborate. And it's fucking hilarious. And just um, just the scope and scale and concept of everything, the execution of everything, it's just an unbelievable accomplishment, let alone being incredibly entertaining, greatly executed. It's just a perfect genius television show. Please watch it. That's really the most I can say. As far as the criticism of this show goes, there's a lot of things of... In the last episode, there's a thing where a child actor becomes emotionally attached to Nathan. And a lot of people are like, this is wrong, what he's doing, blah, 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 blah. Let me tell you this. Number one, you don't even know if it's real. I assume it is. Number two, (laughs) he's a child actor. This child actor is playing someone's son. Okay. This would he believes Nathan to be his real dad because of his own personal traumas. Now, I'm not blaming the child for this, just to be clear. Uh, If this kid were acting in some other thing, he could think the same thing. So like the argument of like this is irresponsible or whatever doesn't make any sense. Regardless, the kid's acting. You know? And he, like, really tried, like, Nathan tried to be like, holy shit, this is really not good. Like, I'm trying to clear this up. He didn't blow the kid off, okay? But the point is, is just, like, it's on the parent for making their child a child actor. It really has nothing to do with Nathan. Now, maybe showing it is the issue that people have, but it's like they agreed to be on the show. So ultimately, you just hate that children are actors. Like, I'm sure that this type of shit happens all the time. If anything, it what this show does is reveal how stupid and silly acting is overall because the whole thing is just filled with actors that are mostly terrible and useless. Um, but it's I mean, it's hard to say what the overall statement and goal of the show is, if there even is one. The point is, it fucking entertains the fuck out of me. <laughs> And it's brilliant, and there's going to be more, thankfully. 
which I don't know how that's going to work, but I cannot wait. Go watch the rehearsal. I love you, Nathan Fielder. You're a genius. Okay. Next topic, please. All right. So next up, before we get into some good old pig scan, we're going to talk about Elvis. So when I first saw the trailer for this movie, I thought it looked fucking amazing. Like it looked really well directed, written, planned out, uh, just incredible production. Everything about it, it was like, oh, this is like a real biopic. Is it biopic or biopic? I always say biopic. But that's like, I say that as though it's two words fused together and is like slang, but I'm pretty sure biopic is just a word. Regardless. Okay. <laughs> uh, just dropped on HBO. And so I was like, fuck it. I got nothing to do. Let's check this three hour monstrosity out. Uh, Boz Lerman. Is that how you pronounce his name? I assume so. Let me double check this. Uh, does has not made a ton of movies, Mr. Boz. But when he does, they are these giant productions, full scale. Like this is a Hollywood big time movie. Romeo and Juliet, Romeo plus Juliet. Excuse me. Uh, still haven't seen it. Don't care. Moulin Rouge, big thing. Don't care. Haven't seen it. Australia. I don't know if that was well received, but same thing. Like epic, big scale. We're doing it. The Great Gatsby, that was okay, but same thing. Just the scope of them are just huge, huge movies. Um, and then Elvis, the same thing. So this movie, it doesn't nece- it's not necessarily like, oh, here's every element of Elvis's life from beginning to end. They kind of pick and choose, but it's mostly in the scope of his business life which in turn is his musical career. My point is, it's not too personal. It's not like, oh, this is when he was fighting with his wife about this. This is what it was like for him with the kid, blah, blah, blah. Which partially makes sense because he was always on the road, which I'll get into. But it is, it's narrated and shown from the perspective of Colonel Tom Parker, who which is, who was his manager, who took massive advantage of him and essentially is the reason why he was so overworked and ended up dead. Uh, also, apparently, was the reason he went into the military. Um, I'm going to assume that most of this is accurate. I will note if I didn't. Okay, but it starts out, you know, he's a young boy, Memphis, whatever. They're poor. It all works out, blah, blah, blah. This guy discovers him at like a state fair or something like that. He rocks the audience, you know, doing his Elvis thing. Uh, I will say they do give Elvis the credit of being like, yeah, I just really love this like soulful gospely bluesy. Like I love black music in Memphis. It's what I grew up on. That's who I grew up with. This is what I like. It doesn't paint him to be this like grand thief thing, which I think is a weird reputation to just be like, well, this is what he grew up, was influenced by, and likes performing. Like, my point just being, like, he didn't go into this being like, I'm going to use this strategically to, like, do something. You know what I mean? He was just doing what he liked. Assuming that that's true, which I do assume is true. But if it's not true, then fuck that, obviously. But I'm just saying, there's a weird thing where it's like, oh, fuck Eminem too like i don't even i don't not like i love eminem not like i love elvis but it's just like i mean what did you expect to happen anyway <laughs> not the point um you know he blows up really quickly he explodes there's nothing like him and all that and then before you know it his life is signed away well actually that's not entirely true I mean, that's true right away that he gives him like 50% right up front, which is just insane. He basically is tricked to sign this deal. He's like, oh, you don't need a lawyer. Like, we're friends. I got your back. Blah, blah, blah. The old thing. And you might say like, oh, why would you do that? This is like 1953 or whatever. So there especially was no type of artist representation. Everybody was getting fucked by everybody everywhere in the entire country, <laughs> you know, in any situation. 
<coughs> and also, nobody had ever been this lucrative, like, in fame. So even, fi- I, I mean, it's wrong for him to only get 50%, don't get me wrong, but even 50% of what he was making was more than what anybody was making, I can guarantee it. So at that point, it's like, do I really feel that bad? Not really. That your spending's out of control and that you're a fucking lunatic, all this shit. Uh <laughs> Uh, but he explodes the famous controversy, you know, he's wiggling his hips and we don't want young girls to see Dick slang. And uh, so basically he goes into Colonel Tom sends him into the army to combat jail time because he convinces Elvis that he's going to go to jail for like pornography, basically. Uh, whether or not that was actually true, I have no idea. I assume not, because that would just be insane. People would have mobbed the jail he was in and, like, broke him out. He had such a rabid fan base. Um, And then, so the movie kind of focuses on, like, major performances in his career, and that's really what it wants to showcase. It's like, hey, this guy could fucking sing, and he could fucking perform as well as anybody in human history. So they're like, here's this classic show, this classic moment, here's him doing this thing, and then they sprinkle in the details around it, almost like um, Danny Boyle's Steve Jobs movie, where Aaron Sorkin just wrote that at three launch events and then like planted everything around it. This follows a more realistic timeline where things happen in between things, you know? But it is centralized based on okay, here's the comeback special. Here's his residency in Vegas. Here's him on Ed Sullivan or whatever show. And I thought that was cool because it's like, look at just how electric this is. And the performances, the direction for them, they feel great. You feel like you're there. There is that like, wow, this is a great show. Like this music is awesome. It feels live. It fe- you feel the energy, which is really hard to replicate. You know, I didn't see Bohemian Rhapsody, but I read that it was a piece of shit anyway. This like, sir, this is like everything you would want out of it. Um, the one thing I think is wrong, from what I understand, they were just like, oh, he turned to prescription drugs like later, like post army, just full of the stress and whatever. I'm pretty sure that happened while he was in the army. That's just my big critique overall. Like that's where it started, and they just kind of they're like, oh, he got married, then he had kids. And I get it. It does kind of showcase like, oh, he was just on the road. He was just focused on his career. All this other stuff just kind of happened to him. They don't show him in the army at all. They don't like it doesn't care about any of this stuff. It's just like, here's the big performances, which I think overall, like it's great for the entertainment value of the movie. But I do think that it leaves some holes and the movie's kind of slow in the middle. Then when he gets out of the army and does that terrible movie career where he was just forced to make these shitty musicals and never got to make a real film really at all, they skim over that whole thing and they go straight to the comeback special. That's when the movie picks back up again because that's all really electric scenes and stuff. Uh, Then it goes to the residency, the blow up with the, the colonel over the management stuff. And it's just pretty crazy, though, that Elvis was already like a sideshow, old news. It was like he was 72 years old doing this Vegas residency, like 400 shows. And like everybody's like, oh, he's washed up and terrible. And it's like that's supposed to happen when you're like 30 years in. The guy was 38 years old, (laughs) like barely anything had happened like that's what's really weird to me is that ultimately Elvis's career was a huge underwhelming like failure. And that's how I view him. That might be wrong, you might think, but it's like, oh, he was huge and awesome and making all this great music, doing these great performances. And then the movies were terrible and then he was never the same again. So there's really just that little brief stretch from when he started to when he went in the army. And that was the whole thing. And like Jailhouse Rock was cool. You know, it's not the best, but you know what I mean? That's when he really had shit popping off. Then he comes back and he's this jumpsuit pill popping, you know? Um, 
And it's revealed that like he wasn't allowed to do an international tour because basically just because the colonel wasn't allowed to leave the country because he technically wasn't a citizen of anywhere. Look, I don't know. At some point, the guy should have taken something into his own hands. Then you see a scene where like he's passed out because he's so drugged up and his dad is like, just fucking inject him with something like I don't even care about my kid. He's like, as long as he can get on stage and I can get my cut, I don't give a fuck. And basically everybody stopped caring about him and they just cared about working for him and just getting those checks off him doing all those shows. But I mean, really, just what a poor decision. I don't know. I think a time machine moment, somebody go back and just give this guy some sound advice and he probably would have been around for a long time. Uh, But it's just really, I just think the whole trajectory is crazy and he got so fat and they cut to real footage right at the end of him singing like super fat and bloated he can't even stand he's passing out on stage and it's just like man this guy all of it just escalated so quickly like he lived 20 years in like four years doing all this shit and it's just really it is tragic like it accomplishes in the end like showing you oh none of this ever should have happened this is all very sad and a lot of people are at fault for this but mostly this one guy and uh yeah that's really my piece on that like great entertaining movie some holes in there but overall it's like man this guy was an insane talent and that talent got wasted by a greedy motherfucker and that's the truth it makes me i mean look you're like a not great educated probably guy from a poor part of memphis tennessee and you rose to a level of fame that higher than anyone ever so it's hard to be like i don't know like you defied all expectations but it's like how were you supposed to know better You know, there's no way anyone can prepare or expect any of this. Uh, But it's just a shame. It's a shame that nobody cared. Like, truly, nobody cared. And that's the saddest thing of all. But at the same time, you know, the back of my brain, it's like, well, how are you going to feel bad for this super rich, like, mega star guy? But, you know, it's the same thing with, like, It's not the same, but like Brian Wilson, you feel terrible for him for just being taken advantage of. He was such a fragile mental state. All the same type of thing. It's just like, I get the idea of being like, oh, I'd love to make some cash off this famous person by like getting hooked up or whatever. But I don't know, like my mentality goes to collaboration versus like, I'm going to squeeze them for everything they're worth or like, I'm going to treat them like they're just fuel for my bank account i don't know very sad just very sad it's one of those really like what could have been and then somehow he's still the number one selling solo artist of all time which to me is insane because he's got like what like three records that are actually worth listening to and like there's a bunch of amazing solo cuts but (sighs) man i don't know just real sad just real sad stuff (laughs) all right It's time for the big guns, ladies and gentlemen. Buckle up. We're doing pigskin. I will also just add that the guy who played Elvis was fucking phenomenal. So whoever that kid is, Austin Butler, whatever your name is, I think you're going to be a star. That was fucking awesome. Okay. And Tom Hanks, you know, not the best performance by him, I got to say. But it was fine. Everybody in it was good. Okay. So let's go to the NFL preview. The season starts Thursday. Cannot fucking wait. I'm just going to run through the divisions. I'm kind of going pretty long here. So I kind of thought I'd have 30 minutes to do this segment. So we'll see. Maybe we still will. We'll we'll just run through it. So we're going to go AFC East. I'm just going to scroll down, go in order here. Okay. The New York Jets. A lot of Jets hype this year. Again, I don't get it. I understand how many people in the media are in New York and want to be from New York. They're the fucking Jets. I don't care how good their draft was. I don't care how their free agency was. I mean, it's Zach Wilson. He's not good. He could be. Maybe. I don't really see it. 
and they're the Jets. They're they're not going to go from worst to first. They're just not. They're not going to make the playoffs. They might win seven games. Might be an improvement for them. But I just hate this like hype. It's a contrast to the Bears thing, right? Where the Bears, quote unquote, have no players. But then you look at the Jets roster and it's like, uh, okay. Well, let's look at it. Running back. Nothing to fucking write home about. Like there's not one. Michael Carter could be good. I don't know. Receiver. Barrios, Corey Davis, Stenzel, like regular guys. Garrett Wilson might end up being awesome. We'll see. But you know what I mean? It's just like all across the board, it's like, am I blown away by any position on this team? Not really. There's some good young talent on defense, but does that mean that they'll play well together? Like, are they going to be well coached? I don't trust anything about them ever. So no. The Bills, the Bills are going to be fucking amazing no matter what. As long as Josh Allen and Stefan Diggs are healthy, I think even if Diggs gets hurt, whatever, you know, knock on wood, I hope he doesn't. They're fucking electric. They're going to win the division. There's no question. Miami, I think they're going to be improved. But I don't trust Mike McDaniel. You can't just hire the guy who's the offensive coordinator for any coach and assume that he's somehow the guy. The whole Todd Bowles, or not Todd Bowles, excuse me. Sorry, we were just talking about the Jets. He used to be there. Anyway, um, the whole Brian Flores drama and all that just leaves a bad taste in my mouth. Now, they had Tyreek Hill. That's amazing. So I think their offense is going to improve greatly. But still, I just don't think that their coach is going to be ready. And I think that they're going to fall apart a lot. So uh, New England, they just don't have the talent. I mean, who knows? But I, I think that they're kind of in shambles, to be honest. Uh, they have like defensive coaches running their offense. That's just not a good decision. They just they traded away offensive linemen. Now look, you can trust Belichick. You probably should. They'll probably outperform expectations. They might win nine, ten games, maybe somehow. Mac Jones is a real guy at the very least. But I don't know. I just don't see it. They lost too many people just on both sides of the ball. I don't know. I, I have just Buffalo making it for now. In the north, Baltimore. I hate Baltimore, but they'll probably win a bunch of games. And I have Lamar Jackson on both fantasy teams that I have, which I think was probably a mistake because I'm afraid for what that means for his health and safety. Uh, <laughs> Pittsburgh, you can't trust Mitch. I'm sorry. I, I'll, I would honestly be happy for him if he goes out and plays well, though. Uh, I've I've completely 180'd. Well, not 180'd. I still think that he's not very good, but I think that all of that was exacerbated by the disaster that is Matt Nagy. Um, but I don't think that he's going to be like some transcendent star now that was worthy of the high draft pick that he got or anything like that. But there's a chance that he's competent for them and can execute. I mean, Mike Tomlin's as good of a coach as you'll have, so if he doesn't play well for them, I think that really shows everything. Uh, I think if they're 500 middle of the season even, there's a chance they switch to Kenny Pickett. Don't know. Uh, I really don't know what to think about them, so I'm just going to call them out. Cleveland, they're out. They're not going to be good without Deshaun Watson, and they. I hope that they're not good with him. The whole thing's just a fucking giant mess, and I don't even want to talk about the Browns. Uh, the Bengals I have winning the division. Uh, they were really good last year. And all I keep reading is how they didn't do enough to improve. This is that same thing I talk about on here all the time where writers talk about like, oh, you don't have an all pro at every position. Like, why didn't you do more to improve your team? It's just like, that's not how team building works. It's impossible to be elite at every position. You just can't do it. Okay. And their biggest weakness by far was their offensive line. They made the Super Bowl with a terrible offensive line. He got sacked more times in the playoffs than anyone in history. And they kept fucking winning. And now that got addressed. The offense was great with a horrible offensive line. The offense is going to be fucking unreal with a good offensive line. They went from terrible to like top 10 at least. And the defense was already solid. And the coaching on defense is really solid. They adjust as well as anybody in the league. It's the reason they made the Super Bowl. So I don't see any reason why you shouldn't 
like I get the Super Bowl hangover thing, but they shouldn't have been there. And typically that's a thing because people leave, coaches leave, you lose personnel across the board, all of that. That didn't happen here. You know, they went further than they should have and then they improved. This this is like their launching point. So I don't know. Assuming they're like nobody has skill position like them. Running back through three wide receivers, they're okay at tight end. I mean, I, I don't see the downside to this team at all, everybody. It's like the opposite of the Jets. Why do you think the Jets should be good? They never are. People are like, well, the Bengals never are. But it's like, no, they actually are now. So, like, what are you looking at? It's weird. Okay. Uh, the South, it's a fucking disaster. I don't even really want to talk about any of these teams. It's going to be Tennessee or Indy. We'll see what Matt Ryan does on Indy, I guess. I don't like their skill guys, really. Like, Michael Pittman's, like, fine. They don't have receivers. Their defense will be good, as always. Tennessee, same thing. A lot of question marks. I don't know. You could probably win this division with nine wins, maybe less. Uh, it wouldn't Honestly, it wouldn't surprise me if any of these teams somehow won. Now, that's kind of rude to Tennessee. They kind of deserve the benefit of the doubt, having just been consistently good. But I don't know. You know? I, I, I just don't know. I, I don't know if it's if it can last because now they're down A.J. Brown. Sure, they replaced him with a similar guy, but this little run might be over. They might have one more in them, but things are going to need to change there soon regardless. I don't know. Now, the AFC West is the complete opposite of the AFC South where, well, I guess it's similar in that anybody could win, but it's it could take fucking 12 wins to get this done. Now, at the same time, everybody could go three and three in the division. Like, I I honestly don't know who to choose from here. The Raiders are not getting any credit for dramatically improving. Everybody's just pissed that they paid Devontae a lot of money. It's like, well, our team's supposed to improve and get these elite players. Or, like, you, you guys got to pick one. You know, you rag on teams that don't make enough additions, then you rag on teams for making additions that aren't efficient. And it's like, well, you can't get Devontae Adams for a, for $7 million a year. Like, you have to pick one. Do you want all pros on your team, Sports Writers of America? Or, like, do you want traditional team? Like, I just don't know what you're looking for. The Raiders went out and spent the money. The Chargers went out and spent the money. The Chiefs went out and spent the money, but the Chargers and the Chiefs get a ton of credit for improving their team, and the Raiders get dissed. Like, it just doesn't add up to me. Denver also. All these teams went out and spent money in draft picks to improve their teams, but really only the Raiders got shit on for it. It just doesn't make sense to me. Um, I don't think Denver will be that good. I think Russell Wilson's kind of falling off. We'll see. Maybe he'll have that bounce-back crazy year that everybody seems to get when they switch teams. Um, Kansas City will be good again. Everybody's just penciling them in again because the initial thing was, oh, I don't know if they've improved that much. And then the zag had to happen to be like, what are you talking about? They bolstered their old line. No, they have a great old line. I don't know. I don't know what to think. I mean, they got Mahomes. They're going to be good. I do think that their offense is going to be less impactful. They're going to be less, but they're going to be more methodical. So they're going to have time of possession and shit like that. We'll see what happens. I'm going to take the Chargers. Something's got to give at some point. Your roster can't be this good. Justin Herbert can't be this good. The defense can't be this good on paper. All of it can't be so fucking like perfect on paper. And for you to not even make the playoffs, that can't be a thing. So I think this is the year the Chargers can actually do it. But we'll see. That whole division's up for grabs. There could be three playoff teams from here. You know? Aren't there three wild cards? All four teams could make the playoffs. Like, there could be no wild cards in any other division. That wouldn't shock me somehow either. I really don't know what to think. (laughs) Honestly, I thought I was going to come in here with all these opinions. It's really tough to call. I'm going to take the Chargers there. Let's recap the AFC. Okay, we're going Buffalo, Cincy, Tennessee, Chargers. Okay, wild cards, we're going to go Kansas City, 
Vegas, Baltimore. So I'm going to say Denver doesn't make it. Mark it down. Okay. (laughs) NFC in the East. The Eagles are going to win. It's not even going to be close. Talk about a team that really improved. They had the best fucking draft. And got more players. Uh, Yeah. I mean, there's a chance Dallas can kind of respond, but they only got worse. The Giants will probably never be good again. (laughs) I mean, they're just like incapable of making successful choices. And Washington, I mean, what do we need to talk about with Washington? They're a fucking embarrassment. I feel bad for Ron Rivera, but whatever. The North, I mean, the Packers are going to win. Detroit, I think, will be frisky. Minnesota just keeps getting every year with the Minnesota. When's the last time the Vikings have done anything? I mean, they've made the playoffs a couple times, but I mean, just it's weird that they just keep getting these like, oh, this no, they're good. Look at the roster. Look at the roster. It's like, I get it. They have good receivers. That's it. People keep saying they have a good defense. I, I don't see it. When? At times, sure, but like five years ago, the team was fucking stacked. Uh, I, I don't know. I think the Viking the Vikings are bad. <laughs> I I really don't understand any Vikings love at all. I think Detroit will be better than Minnesota, and I think the Bears could potentially be better than them too. As I've talked about, the Bears are going to be better than people expect. They just keep getting shit on and shit on and shit on nationally, but that's people who like just literally aren't paying attention to them at all. I think that the coaching staff makes a big difference. I think that they got guys that fit into the system that they want. And I think that they will be, again, better than expected. Now, do I think they're going to win a bunch of games? No. The defense will be better than people think. The offensive line and receivers will be better than people think. I mean, the Chiefs somehow don't get knocked for not having this elite receiving core. And I get it. Again, they have Patrick Mahomes and probably a good offensive line. But look at the names on that list. There's names you recognize, but are they these elite Guys, other than Kelsey, it's like, no, they brought in Juju Smith-Schuster, Marquez Valdez-Scantling. Like, it's basically just a grade level up of what we did, bringing in Byron Pringle from the Chiefs and, um, like, having Darnell Mooney. You know, we brought in St. Brown. Like, we did the same thing, just at our scale. I, I don't know. It, it's just the contradictory bullshit's fucking annoying, And look, they could also be terrible. All I'm looking for out of the Bears is not a great record. It's just that the offense looks good. Fields gets comfortable. He develops further. And we're in a step in the right direction for next year when we have finally draft capital as well as a fuck ton of unbelievable cap space. So really all you want out of this season for the Bears anyway is I mean, the higher the draft pick, the better. So the best case scenario is like they go three and 14, but Justin Fields stats aren't terrible and he doesn't get his ass kicked and they're clearly building something, you know, but I, I honestly think that they're, they're going to be more competitive than people think. If anything, they'll be like the Lions were last year, maybe with less mistakes, ideally. Uh, but the Lions seem to have a good roster, too. Who knows? I just believe in Dan Campbell. I think he's fucking awesome and Hard Knocks was great. Uh, But regardless, the Packers are going to win the division. I think that they'll take a step down on offense, too, without Devontae Adams. I mean, that's no question, but they'll be fine. Their defense is going to be unbelievable. Uh, Yeah, play the Bears week two. Going to be rough. Week one, San Francisco. It's not going to be great. Uh, The NFC South. Yikes. Tampa, just by default, they have a lot of offensive line problems. The whole thing with like, oh, Brady, he's going off the rails. What's going to happen? If you, He just took 10 days off. Look, if you don't think Tom, if anybody can take 10 days off in training camp, it's Tom Brady, especially it's his third year in the system. He knows exactly what he's going to do. The weapons are just as plentiful as ever. As long as the row line stays relatively healthy and they get the guys back they need, they're going to be just fine. I mean, what are we talking about? <laughs> you know? The fact that there's any concern, but I don't think anyone else is even going to remotely be a threat. You know, Carolina might do that thing where, oh, they're four and one, and then they're going to end up, you know, seven and ten or whatever. 
Atlanta basically just has no shot. New Orleans, I just don't see it without Sean Payton. I think that their offense is going to really struggle. The defense might be fine, but uh, I don't think they're going to be able to score the kind of points they need to win. Then the NFC West, boy, the Wests are just stacked, except Seattle. They're a fucking nightmare. They gave up. They have no chance. Uh, the Rams, I think, are going to fall off. I don't, I don't see... I don't see them repeating as division champs. I don't think Arizona is going to make the step up that they need, especially without Hopkins for six weeks. Kyler Murray always gets hurt and then they fall off and they don't adjust. So, I mean, if San Francisco can stay healthy, but they never fucking can, which I think is an indictment of their coaching staff, but also possibly their player scouting. Like you can't get guys that can get healthy or maybe you don't know how to fucking manage these people. But, the, you know, they're just so talented. I think they'll be fine. Uh, I believe that if they do struggle, too, they kept Jimmy G for a reason. I think they'll bench Trey Lance if they have to. I don't think Kyle Shanahan really gives a fuck about any of his players, which is not good, which is why I think that they struggle when it gets into the playoffs and they just can't get a win. It's also because they're hurt, you know, as I've said. But a lot of talent there. But, I mean, geez, the wild card race is wide fucking open in the NFC. I don't even know who would have a chance. I mean, Arizona, the Rams could be involved. Like, maybe New Orleans, even though I just said no, you know. Uh, You could probably win a wild card spot sub 500. Honestly. I don't have confidence in a lot of the Like, maybe the third wild card spot. Don't get me wrong, but. I don't have a ton of confidence in any of these teams. The NFC is incredibly weak outside of the West, and even still, it got weaker than it was because that all went to the AFC West. So I'm going to say the Bears are going to make a wild card spot just based on looking at this. I know that that's crazy, but that's my bold prediction. So let's call the wild cards. All right, I'll say Dallas, Chicago, and the Rams. Those are my NFC wild cards. Division picks. Again, Philly, Green Bay, Tampa, San Francisco. It's mostly chalk. I mean, what can you say? The NFC is far inferior. Thrilled for the season to begin. Sadly, could not make any great futures bets. So I didn't look into it too much. Your boys broke. Buy the merch. That'll help out a lot. Uh, but I wanted to go through some of those too, but you know, it is what it is. Maybe next year real quick. Let's just do a Adams fantasy teams recap. Everybody loves hearing about other guys, fantasy teams. I just want to say, I think both of my drafts went pretty well. My Yahoo team, Lamar Jackson, Jamar Chase, DK Metcalf, Michael Thomas, Nick Chubb. Unbelievable start right there. Uh, David Montgomery. Yeah. I'm always weak at running back. I can never do anything to prevent that either. I, no matter how much I tell myself, it's like wherever I am in the draft, the the great, great ones that I want aren't available. And then by my second pick, the great, great receivers won't be there. So I always fuck up and ju- I just do it. Anyway, Dawson Knox, tight end, Alan Lazard, Harrison Butker, kicker, Green Bay defense, Tyler Boyd. Daryl Henderson Jr., like, see my backup. Run- I have a backup running back as my backup running back. Aaron Rodgers, Austin Hooper, Kendrick Bourne, if Jeff Wilson Jr. So thin at the end there, but I'm excited. I think that team will perform well. Second fantasy team. This is on the Sleeper app, which I'm not familiar with, but it looks like it was made by Discord. I have no idea. Okay, Lamar Jackson yet again. Ezekiel Elliott, Cam Akers did better at running back here. Uh, Cooper Cup, Cortland Sutton, who I hear has a better connection with Wilson than Jerry Judy currently. Pat Fryermuth, love him. Took him ahead of some other guys that were higher rated. Don't care. Uh, (laughs) Damian Harris, Nick Folk, they're going to be kicking a lot of field goals. I I feel good about that one. The Chargers D, which they're going to be good, but who they'll be playing against does kind of hamper how well they'll perform, but whatever. Derek Carr, Gus Edwards. That was a tough pick. Hopefully he'll be fine by week four or five, five, right? It would have to be. Uh, Valdez Scantling took a gamble on Traylon Burks and Tyler Higby. I'm a big backup guy. I make sure everybody's got a backup. Don't care what you have to say. 
I would rather have less to choose from per position because I'm a big second guesser and I almost always swap out the wrong guy at the last minute and the guy I swap does much better on my bench happens every time I understand that that happens to everybody that's why talking about fantasy football is really hard because there's no such thing as a unique experience everybody knows exactly what it is like okay (laughs) we had a big one today thanks for tuning in I cannot wait for this NFL season to kick off this Thursday and then Sunday and I'll see you next week I'm sure there will be a lot of Bears stuff after week one. We'll see what happens. It's going to be a great year, ladies and germs. I have been Adam Pacora. I will be Adam Pacora. This has been and will be Requiem for a Tuesday. We'll catch you next week. But remember, I are fat. You are fat. We are fat. Kelk. Thank you later.